And we're on the air. Hello, Code Mentor friends. Welcome to Code Mentor Office Hours. Uh, my name is Mark. Um, looks like we have some new faces, which is great to see. Um, if this is your first time joining us, basically what we do is uh, we call up, you know, some of our favorite tech experts who, you know, are specialists in something our community is trying to get better at, and have them on here to sort of walk us through and clarify different different technical projects that we all could be getting better at as uh, developers. Um, so uh, we're really excited today to have another great guest, and we're going to have a, a session focused on uh, Reactive. Um, uh, but in terms of format, uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction in a second and kick it over to our guest. But if you guys have any questions throughout the session, if you're in the live room with me here, uh, you're welcome to use group chat, and I'll be sort of cataloging all the questions as we go. We'll hit as many as we can at the end. Um, if you're watching the live broadcast from Google+, Google Plus, um, there's a Q&A app. Um, it can be a little hard to find, but it's like a little green Q&A button, um, and I'll get notifications about those. So we'll try to hit as many questions as we can at the end. Um, but without further ado, um, our guest today is uh, Jonas Bonaire, who is the founder and CTO of TypeSafe. Uh, he's also the co-author of the Reactive Manifesto. Um, in 2011, he became a Java champion, and in 2012, he was actually voted the number one developer in Sweden. It's a pretty awesome credential. Um, he's an active contributor to the open source community, most notably created the Akka project and the Aspect Works aspect-oriented programming compiler. Um, he's joining us today from Sweden and will be giving us an intro to reactive systems and how they can drastically improve scalability. So if you've been working on any projects, thinking about using this technology but worried about scalability, hopefully we'll hit what you need here. So without further ado, please welcome Jonas. Thank you. I'm going to kick off my presentation here. Can you ever, can you see it? Yep, looks good. Okay, yeah, I, I don't need an, another introduction. I don't, need to, in, I don't need to introduce myself. That was that was uh, it was almost uh, like a humbling experience and almost an embarrassing experience here. <laughs> uh, I don't know how much how much actually Sweden knows about computer science and so on, but it's it's uh, it's it's on my CV. Uh, uh, but but today, today I'm going to talk to you about reactive systems and what it means to build reactive systems, uh, reactive architectures, and and uh, the the, so the the fundamental underpinnings of reactive and what it really means in terms of of, of the of the principles. Uh, I won't show you much code. I will try to like keep it more of an of an architectural overview and 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 give you. Hopefully, like a, like a solid understanding of what reactive is all about and what it means, regardless of which language you're 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 using day day to day or what what platform you are deploying it on, and so on. But let's start to take a look back, right? I mean, we it, most people probably like when when they when they have or when they look back. I mean, can agree that the the rules have really fundamentally changed for us as developers the last last like 10, 15, 20 years. It's really a completely different ball game now, now, now nowadays. And and even though most people are familiar with it, we easily for, for, for forget it. I think, and it's 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 worth to do a small recap. I think what it really what really have changed, and uh, so we have like a uh, like, a, like a sound basis for for why I think a new approach is needed. So yesterday, sort of like like 10, 15 years ago, systems used to be like written for to be run on single machines, right? But today we have a, di a distributed system from day one. It's really and a distributed system is really has really a complete different set of challenges and also poss possibilities. But the important thing is that it's a very different world. And all these like single machines, they used to run like, single single core processors. And today, it's really hard to find a, a single core processor. So, like, there, there's multi-core everywhere. Even, even my phone is a multi-core. It's actually a quad-core. Uh, processor and and this also completely changes the game. Like mutable state used to be okay, you know the the the, the heritage of the von Neumann architecture and then and 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 it used we we used to like be able to live in this like safe world, sort of a living in a lie a little bit, but 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 life was good. But to, but but multiple processors like completely changed the picture. I mean today we just can't fake it any longer. Things actually happen in parallel for real. And I think we really need better tools and, and, and high, more high-level abstractions to deal with that on on a day-to-day on -day basis. 
uh, RAM used to be really, really cheap. No, no, sorry, really, really ex 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 expensive. And that, 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 that also sort of influenced a lot how software had to be re re had to be written. But today, RAM is incredibly cheap. I mean, the, the, which opens up for a lot of interesting opportunities, like in memory caching. You, you can actually suck in the whole database into memory and just use it there. Uh, same thing with disk. Disk used to be very expensive, and and that and that's the reason why, for example, in place update well, is an is a norm in C, in SQL databases because I mean, we we just could not afford to keep all state around forever. But today, disk is so cheap, so there's really no reason to use in place updates like the destructive updates in our in our databases. You know, all databases are using a transaction log actually storing the data under the hood, but they they, they don't expect. Ex like expose that that sort of data set to our to our users to us as users, right? So we need to, I mean, like jump over hope, over hopes, right? To 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 like to, to to like sort of maintain that that history ourselves using additional tables and so on, which I think is madness. So this is so cheap. So there's really no reason why we shouldn't keep data around forever, really, at least like for for as long as we really need to. Um, networks used to be extremely slow, and today they are incredibly fast. It also opens up for like things like like replication, and it's it's actually sometimes faster to write to the network than than, than to disk, and and uh, also completely changes the the, la the landscapes and opens up for very interesting like uh, distributed computing. Uh, architectures and all these applications they used to be re written for for very few concurrent users. I, mean, I remember when I started in the in the like the late 90s. I mean, a, f a fairly big application had like in users in the thousands, <clears throat> and and uh, today that we, we we can just laugh at that, right? I mean, I mean, most applications are put out on the internet, and this mean that means they are exposed to like hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of users. And all these users, they used to produce like, like fairly small data sets. But nowadays, I mean, with all the sort of requirements of the applications need to be like, you know, engaging and empowering, the users should be like have access to all this data and also, I mean, communicate with others in real time. All these all this, all this data actually needs to be like almost constantly, immediately avail, avail, available and replicated for for resilience and so on. And and uh, we need to do all this while keeping latency in milliseconds. You know, latency used to be okay in seconds. I mean, it was actually okay to sit to like like you know refresh the browser for quite some time. But today, uh, users are in incredibly impatient. And, and if, if the application is not responsive, down, down for too long, or, or that doesn't feel like uh, actually that you are in charge, right? And, and that is like under your fingers. You, users usually look elsewhere and go, and go to a competitor and so on. And, <clears throat> and this, is just around, this is just like what's happening now, around the corner, actually. We can expect billions of devices all connected. What is what is you know, I mean, popularly called the, in, the, in, the Internet of Things. You know, where 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 you have like, like a smart car, health monitors, you know, like smart homes, refrigerators, or whatever, coffee machines, all talking to the Internet. And then the GSM Association predicts that in 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 2020 we, we will have about 24 billion devices all connected. To the internet, and and uh, some some people think that is actually a low estimate. That is probably like twice as many. And all these computers, they will they, they won't run like eight or like four, four four and eight cores like we have today. They will run hundreds of cores. Sometimes th perhaps thousands of cores, like 10, 20 years from now. I mean, and the question is, how do we as developers deal with this? How can we keep up and make use of all these great hardware and all these great there are, there are new usage patterns like how, we, how can we serve our users and and, and 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 make them happy and I really think that this completely different world needs very different tools it needs a different mindset a completely different way of thinking about software and and uh, that is sort of captured in what I believe is reactive applications so reactive systems so uh, the word reactive sort of means, according to Mary Webster, readily responsive to, to, a, to a stimuli. And if you break it, if you break it down, uh, I, I believe that it's, the essence is like four main 
the sort of key pillars or key principles of uh, that sort of holds it all up. And and, and these. These uh, these four like support each other and 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 sort of empower each other. And in this in this talk, I will I will I will try to walk you through each one of these and see and explain why I think they are important and what challenges are there and how we how you how we all can can make it can make it happen. And hopefully, we will have an interesting QA afterwards. So uh, and also, if you think if if you want to like dive a little bit deeper down, or want to have some some reference ma material to 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 come back to after, we uh, I was I've been part of writing up what's called really reactive manifesto. It's sort of an, an intro an intro or a sort of, sort of like summary or, or like a call for arms, you may say, right? What it means to be, to write write reactive systems, and it walk you, walk you through these. These sort of four pillars and, and why they are important. I think it's also uh, followed. It's also sort of backed by a nice glossary, walking you through some details in the in the in the vocabulary and so on. So, <clears throat> starting with the first one, <clears throat> responsive. Responsive means quick to respond and react appropriately to Merriam-Webster, according to Merriam-Webster. Mer Mer it's really about being able to react to users. I mean, you know, you know, in this. Users today are extremely impatient. They want they, they want to have this like real time engaging, you know, rich and collaborative, uh, engaging applications. And and this means that 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 problems they need to be like detected quickly and dealt with efficiently. And 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 they must and, and systems must always be able to to provide a good response time, right? It's easy to do it when you have like blue sky scenarios and everything is fine. But 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 system, but it's as important, perhaps even more important, that, that that system stay responsive when there's when there's like spikes in the load, you know, Black Friday or over Christmas season, or sometimes, I mean, when it gets like slash dotted, right, or like sort of metaphor for for like unpredictable load, when 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 things go extremely well, according to like viral or whatever, word word, word of mouth. I mean, how do you deal with that? How can you make sure that you that you stay Responsive under really heavy, unpredictable load, and 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 even more importantly, how can you stay responsive when things start to fall apart? When 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 you have unpredictable failures, when when like subsystems stop working, and you need a way to still be able to respond to your users and have a way of 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 uh, perhaps sometimes say no to one third or half or 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 or, or a tenth of the users while be able to to continue to serve the rest of the ninety percent or or whatever it is have a way like a like a sandboxing and that it, and and deal with it like in terms of what is called graceful degra degradation not just flat out dive and having a solid way of dealing with it uh, I think that's extremely important and 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 now I'm going to like to talk about first resilience, meaning what it, what what will it take to stay responsive when things start to fall apart, and and then I'm going to move over to what is called elas el 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 elasticity, and elasticity is, is sort of a superset of scalability. So what and 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 talk about what it means to stay responsive under heavy load. Uh, and then we hope, and then we'll tie it all together in the end. So resilient, resilience means, to according to Merriam-Webster, Mer Mer the ability of a substance or object to, to spring back into shape. And I think this is extremely important. This is a great definition because I think for me, resilience is more than being fault tolerant. Fault tolerant means that you can you, you can take a hit, but uh, and and then you can like limp along. Uh, but and that's fine in certain situations, but being fully resilient means that you can that you can restore like 100% uh, of, of of your of your service, fully spring back into shape. Uh, uh, so so and, and as I said, I think it's extremely important that the system stays responsive under the, in the face of failure. Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> resilience is something that we as, as developers, especially as, at least in the, in the world where I believe in, like the, the, the Java enterprise world, and, and, and have, been, have been sort of used like sort of hand way in a way, right? Something that we, that we thought, that we thought it, it would be okay to just bolt on afterwards. 
usually using like very expensive tools or like like turn on some clustering software or like uh, slap a data grid on top and or like in memory caching and hopeful and hope for the best, right? Like like uh, turn on HTTP session clustering and so on and think it's not harder than that. Actually, nothing could be further from the truth. I think it's it's, it's like it's like for the, the fundamentally wrong way of dealing with it. Since failure is something that, as we will talk about later, when you start especially running in a distributed system, is something that will just happen. It's a fact. It's nothing really exceptional either. It's something that, that, that like, I, I see failures sort of as a natural state in the application's life cycle. And if you look at it like that, the failure is, is, is expected, it's nothing special, it's just another state in the, in the application's life cycle. If you look at it from that perspective, that, then failure is something that you should manage, right? It's like, it's like, it's like just another state in your, in your, in your, in your state machine. Like you, have, you, you, you start the application, you, you initialize it, you, you, you run it, and you stop it, and, and then you upgrade it, perhaps, and it, and you, and it fails, right? There's nothing special about that. And, and, and thinking it from that perspective, like, completely changes the picture. Now we need to, to start with it from day one, right? It's part of the, should be part of the design all the way through. <clears throat> and and, I th and, and that's, as I will talk more, more in detail in just a few seconds, the key here is isolation, being able to contain the failure, to avoid cascading it across the application, and in the worst case, take down the whole application. <clears throat> so, one, one, one sort of metaphor, one, one way of explaining it, one analogy that I try to use, uh, that I often use, is, 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 is one, the one with the vending machine. Most people know what the vending machine is. <clears throat> so let's let's th let's think we have this this uh, this made up scenario, right? We, you have you have a vending machine, like a coffee machine, and you ha and you have this pro this programmer, and the, and the and the programmer is really eager to get to get to get a coffee. So <clears throat> so he walks up to the vending machine and he he, he inserts some 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 coins. So. Now let's say that that the machines uh, uh, accepts two two quarters or two Swedish kronas or whatever you have like you know, two pounds or uh, and, and and so if the if the program puts in one one then quarter for example or one dollar uh, the machine responds with like add more coins like because the the, the programmer now he's he's not like fulfilled his his part of the contract he needs to put two coins in. And then he will get his coffee, so he will get sort of validation error, like add more coins. So now, if if the if the programmer add, adds more coins, he will get his coffee, and he's a and he's a and he's a happy guy. He can go back hacking again. But now, ne the next day he comes up, and now he's actually putting in two coins, and he expects his coffee. But now, what if the vending machine now like returns? Like throws like an out of coffee beans error in his face, so like bean jammed like exception, or 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 something. That's not what you would what you would expect from a coffee machine. How would you deal with that? I mean, where would you find the coffee? Where where where's the key to the machine? Like, is it is it your responsibility as a programmer to open up the machine and start like tinkering around with it, trying to fix the the, the problem? That's usually what not what you expect, right? When you put in your two coins. It's not your business, essentially. So I think this just this is just fundamentally wrong. Well, what's happening instead is that is that ideally, at least, I mean, a notification should 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 go out to the service guy. He's running around and all this all the floors fixing and maintaining the, these 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 machines, and he will go in and fix it. He will add more beans, lower like fix the the jammed. Uh, beans uh, in the grinder or something like that, and the programmer will get his coffee, and everyone's happy. Uh, and I think this is really the right way of thinking about uh, error, like failure management and error handling. It should, it should, because I mean, as, as programmers, we are giving a single thread of control, right? And 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 and, and if you look at how how you deal with this in Java, <clears throat> you know, if something really goes wrong. And, and and then if that thread blows up, then you're screwed, right? This this single thread of control is everything you have. 
So this is why 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 we often have to have to deal have to deal with it by 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 like, like, like sort of scattering like try catch statements across the whole a whole a whole program. It's essentially the first scenario that I that I walked you through in the in, in the vending machine. That we as programmers can never know when something goes wrong, and we're always responsible we're responsible for fixing all errors. I think this just this is just fundamentally wrong. I, I think the right way is a client should make a request and he should get a response, right? But if there's something, if he if he hasn't fulfilled his 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 part of the contract, he should get a validation error thrown right in his face. A helpful one that 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 says oh, you haven't fulfilled your part of the contract or the protocol, please fix that and and repeat your 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 request. But if there's if 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 something fundamentally goes wrong, that's not the client's uh, job to deal with. Right, if it's an application for like failure, if something, if the, if, if the database is down or, or something, how should the client deal with that? It's, 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 I think it's really, it's really, really completely broken that that is even notified to, to the client, at least it, as, as the only thing. Instead, it should be notified to someone that actually can do something about it. Call it the supervisor. And the supervisor can then do, like, manage that, that component, the service in this case. And, and, and the interesting thing is that if all this communication is synchronous, then you're stuck, right? But if, if all of this communication happens over asynchronous boundaries, then the service can actually be completely managed in isolation, even without the client even knowing. You know, application failure can be sent to the supervisor. He can actually restart the component and, 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 and like resume service, and the client can get to its response, and the client didn't even notice that the service was restarted. Uh, I, I really, I really believe this this sort of mental model really changes the picture completely and and, and gives us a much better way to, to actually design for resilience because I really believe, as I said, resilience is by design, fundamentally. <clears throat> and 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 if all this communication is happening asynchronously, it allows us to manage failure in isolation. And this this is not a new like trick or a new a new concept at all. This is how the ship industry have have been have been dealing with with failure management and fault tolerance for 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 decades using what what they call bulkheading, in which in which you have uh, in which you sort of, sort of um, divide the ship into into like isolated comp comp compartments, and if one of them the rips open and it's filled filled up with water, that's fine. Right, probably three or five. If half of them are ripped open, yeah, then you have a severe error and the ship is probably sinking. But it's very resilient to failure since all these sort of buckets are fully isolated. And I really think this is the way we need to to start de de designing soft software, like preventing cascading failures through compartmentalization. And as I said, this also gives us a way then to manage failure locally, like like this. Compartment for like by compartment, um, and and uh, if if you if you use that model then together with what I call supervision, then then you can start building what I call like sort of an onion architecture. An onion in this case doesn't mean that it's so terrible that it makes you cry when you start slicing it and, and, and like in dicing it, but it it it, it means that it that it, that that you that you start de designing your service in a way that you have in layers, and 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 where where your where your your critical service is like in the in the center of the onion, and as as and as soon as you're you're you're, you're about to do something dangerous, you never do it yourself, you delegate it to the next layer in the onion, so to speak. Next layer in 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 your application. So 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 as you always delegate dangerous tasks. You 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 can call it that you have that you're like building like layers of defense. So it will take quite a, se a severe error to 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 to. I mean, for example, if a user request comes in from the inner like from from the outside, it hits the first layer in the in the in the on, and then something goes severe, severely wrong. Then, then, then the next layer in the onion will be notified, and and something 
and, 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 can, and, can, and can try to take action. And if something's really, really going wrong, like if it's out of memory, it will, it will like take down your all your defense layers all the way down into the into like innermost uh, sort of set of services that holds on to your like your critical state or whatever it is, and and, and it might take down the whole application. And if you then have 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 some have have uh, written your application according to the elastic principles that you that like, that you have a distributed system, then you can actually deal with that. But that is sort of an exception. It's 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 actually very very likely that you will be able to deal with the failure at at, at the first levels of, of of defense, so 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 to speak. So in this in this little example, let's see for example that 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 that, that component B is then is then is then hit with an error. A can then A will then be notified, and the component will be restarted. And 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 without any of the other components even not even even realizing that that even happened, this is how you, for example, we have sort of this is the way we of failure management that we have adopted in Aka, where we where we have uh, something called actors that are naturally actually uh, um, there is actually a mandatory. To, to be to be to be composed using supervisor hierarchies, but this is a pattern that you can use in in, in almost in any in any sort of situation in any any language or or, or or with any tools. The important thing is that you have this asynchronous boundary, and 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 you and you and you're able to like ma like fully isolate your 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 components from the for the error to leak into cascade. And as I said, I really believe that the true resilience then requires a message-driven architecture because it's this asynchronous boundary between the components that gives you the isolation. And this is something that we see outside out, outside um, the reactor principles, like uh, for some microservices. It's just really it's really about isolation, but single responsibility. And being able to 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 uh, to have components fail in isolation and be upgraded in isolation, be replicated in isolation, like that means that they can usually be 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 uh, load balanced very easily and so on. The second thing that I really, or for the third pillar, we talked about responsiveness, but responsiveness really means responsive in the face of failure. As I said, but it also means we be staying responsive in when when you when the work workload is is varying a lot. So this the systems really need to be what we call elastic. And as I said, elastic I think is for me is is a superset of scalability. Scalability means that you, I mean that system. You, I mean that when you add when you start adding resources. Uh, to the system, the, the system can 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 deal with like cope with more with more with more load. But elastic means that they can actually scale down the system as well. And 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 ideally, you want you want a system that is adaptively elastic, so you can actually scale up when needed and scale down when needed, to to make sure that you use the hardware efficiently. A lot of applications today are are deployed on cloud services, right? And then you actually pay as you go. You don't want to have like 100 nodes spun up uh, when you when your average is that you know you need, that you need 10, right? You need you might, you might need 100 at peak times, but but why pay for that all the time? You want a system that's actually able to detect sometimes predictably, but also react reactively that the system is now under have uh, starting to 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 be be hit with heavy load and then spin up instances and be able to to like. Elastically grow, as 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 well as being be able to elastically shrink when systems the system detects that it's not uh, using more than I don't know twenty percent of the CPU or something. So, I, I really think that for uh, sort of scaling for me means means two things, and I'm going to talk about them one by one. First, it means scaling up. And scaling up really means like you really sort of like having a way to, to utilize multi-core architectures very very efficiently, and and I really I really think that the, you need two things to really to really write a fully scalable architecture, and that is you need to first minimize contention, and the second thing is you need to maximize locality of reference. <clears throat> contention is the is the biggest scalability scalability killer there is. There's, 
It's really, as soon as there's contention, that means that, they, that, they, that there's wait time. It means that work that could have been done can't be done because you have like a queue, like, of, 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 like components or services waiting to, to a lock to be released or some, a resource to be freed or if it's like a semaphore, like get access to it to, within, within the constraints that semaphore have set up and so on. So <clears throat> the, 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 the second really, really, really key thing is locality reference. And what I mean by that, that is that you should, you, you, you should really keep data close to where it's being used, close to its, its, its processing context. Because in, in, in modern CPU architectures, uh, I mean, keeping data close, I mean, in the L1 the cache is extremely fast. But as soon as you start going up to the L3 cache that is shared among the, among the processors, um, things to, to run, can be orders of magnitude slower, and uh, and uh, and like things like memory access patterns matter. I mean, how how how, um, for example, how how the code is being, like 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 branching, for example, and 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 uh, and, and 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 patterns in the code. I mean, that that the, the, the CPU can start doing prefetching when it when it really realizes that that you're like looping over a uh, over an array, for example. And and uh, and usually, I mean, simple code practices really 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 matters. Uh, keep keep code simple. Branching factor low. Uh, small small methods. And 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 and, to, and try to keep data close to where it's being used. And one also thing thing that can really help here is use immutable state, to 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 never share state needlessly, but but only, only only sort of use local data in the local processing context, free of 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 of. of uh, uh, so like like for on on a single thing on a single thread. But, it is, but as soon as you're done with that work, you can publish it to other threads or other, other processes uh, uh, using immutable state. Then there's no contention at all, and everyone can just read completely freely, which, which can help a lot. In general, I think, I think one really good advice is that you always, should tr always strive to go asynchronous, because, because asynchronous message passing together with immutable state Really can completely eliminate uh, contention and wait time. Uh, it's really it's really concurrent by design. And the nice thing that concurrency then uh, the way the way I look at it, if you rely on, on asynchronous message passing, then then concurrency really becomes workflow. Because because the way the way you think about it is, I mean, the world that doesn't work with with like shared mutable state. Like, I mean, I own this piece of data. No one else can look at it. I'm guarding it with this, with this lock. And, and when I'm done with it, I, I, I let one other person take that work over. Right? It's, it's, the, the word is really essentially message passing. It, and, and the word is inherently concurrent. So, so it's really how we, we as humans are, 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 are really used to work and communicate and, and, and deal with, with, with things. So if, if, if you think in, in, uh, about like concurrency in the way of, of message passing, it really becomes workflow. It really becomes communication patterns. Who talks to who and, and saying what and, 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 and uh, who's delegating work to who and, 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 um, and so on. And that I think that that sort of usually maps to to business rules and business logic, while while like low level thread locks, uh, semaphore mutexes, plumbing is is like so far from from business uh, semantics or business logic as you can get. You really raise the abstraction level uh, by adopting a mechanism like like this or or, or on 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 approach like this. And and I and and, and some and some people say that yeah, but yeah, but async, asynchronous systems they are they are like so hard, right? right? And it's like completely different world. And and yes, in a way that's that that's somehow true, right? I think there is an uh, there is th that you will if if you're not used to it, you you that you you will take like an an initial hit of what I call the essential complexity of the problem. I mean, the essential complexity of actually dealing with the world it is, that the, the, the way it is, right? It is distributed. You have mobile 
users or you have this many users and you need to keep keep things under under control when things start to fail and so on but it has usually a very low accidental com complexity while well, while, sys while synchronous systems usually have a fairly low uh, initial essential complexity because they feel uh, like familiar but they, they so easily get out of hand. I mean, they have an immensely high accidental complexity with shared mutable state and like fully synchronous, like not I mean, completely coupled code and so on. And this is why I think we often have see this like this big rewrite after three, four years. The system just got, got completely out of control. Nobody understands it any longer, and we just have to rewrite it. I think I think I think I mean hitting the essential complexity like head first relying on asynchronous message passing and isolation like loosely coupled systems I, th I, th I think it's usually a recipe for success even though it feels more complicated up front and there are a lot of good tools that can, that can help us with this right I mean explicit queues or like you know, MPI if you see actors is one of my favorite ones like what we have in Akka and Erlang or so on there's a lot of new fun abstractions around streaming that it just came up came out the last years like RX Java for example Aka streams is another one that we have implemented and so on so so there's no reason to 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 write your own libraries or so another really important thing is that you, you should never ever block and this is also something that usually falls out of these good libraries that 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 you can use today for asynchronous uh, sort of uh, for writing asynchronous systems, <clears throat> it's, 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 it is the fact that that like that like putting a thread to sleep, doing blocking, in, incurs a very high wake up cost. Like you know, last la, la, last time I checked, it was like about about, about six hundred nanoseconds on a, on a on a Haskell processor on my MacBook Pro, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, right? But 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 it actually is, especially if it happens all the time. And and uh, as I, as I said, if we if we if we like if you use lock free con con concurrency and asynchronous message passing, I think I think you tend to not uh, kind of sort of go down into the blocking rat hole much. And sometimes you have to block because the service you're using might block. So how do you deal with that then? And I think that's the case where you where you where you need to like use like use things like sandboxing, for example, making sure that you you have a dedicated thread pool for that service or that set of services that it might block. So if if if, if all your if 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 everything seems to go or start blocking all the way through or, or these unpredictable services start going haywire. Then, then uh, the, the worst thing that can happen is that you exhaust that blocking serves the blocking uh, like tagged uh, thread pool, and the rest of the system is is healthy and fine, and can continue until the service um, comes back. And and I also think that that this sort of mentality that needs to be asynchronous and block and non-blocking needs to be adopted all the way down, and. <clears throat> Most people have probably heard about Amdahl's law. Not that many have, per, have probably heard of Ginter's Neil, Neil, Neil Ginter's universal scalability <coughs> law. Uh, Amdahl's law, you know, is, is sort of states that it sort of explains the effect that contention has on on a parallel systems. That increased contention can give, give diminishing returns. That is the dotted line you can see here. But 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 it, it's, it's actually. Uh, so, so, what what Amdahl sort of explains here is the best case. What 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 Neil Ginter realized was that the world is actually not that good, it, and it it has also this concept that he calls co coherency. Actually, the the work that needs to be done to to have data in sync. So, so if if you apply that to the to, to the math, that means that incoherency can actually means that you have not just diminishing returns but negative results. Meaning, if you, if you start adding more threads to to such a system, the coherency cost of maintaining the consistency actually eats up all the benefits, and you get a negative re result. Uh, and 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 the and the key takeaway here is that is that we we need to minimize coordination. Coordination meaning contention. In, in the wait time, it's really what kills performance and scalability throughout. 
and I, I really think that the simplest way we can do is, is to fully embrace a share nothing architecture. To, to write our, our components, our microservices, our actors, or, or whatever it is, uh, in a fashion that they do never share state. You work on local data within these processors, uh, or, or actors, or whatever you want to call them. And when they're done, they publish immutable state to, to the outside world, the result of the computations, uh, completely free from contention, completely free from race conditions, or all these nasty things. And, <clears throat> and the nice thing with this, with this is that it, by design, gives you great locality reference and minimize contention. You know the two, the two like, uh, key, key points of, of scalability. And another sort of nice uh, sort of rule of thumb that I use that I try to apply is that is is um, is, is sort of what we learn from Caesar uh, that is you divide and conquer. Try to split up the work into like small, discrete, independent tasks. Like try to strive for like having in, like no coupling between them, so you can you can run them fully in parallel. This opens up for 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 things like pipelining, for example. Where we have stages of events flowing between these uh, these stages, and and pipelining can be can sometimes be sy be synchronous and can actually be a beneficially synch synch synchronous. I mean, not everything should be async. Uh, I'd, I'd, I I but 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 sometimes you need a combination of having some stages asynchronous and some and some synch synchronous. And ideally, we want to run computations like staged on a single thread because on a single thread it means that there's no cache invalidations, no copying of memory, there's no contention at all. You can just write as as as, as fast as you as you can as you can go. Uh, but so I, so I think I mean single threaded pipelines are great if you can max out on your CPU. If you if you see that the CPU can act like that it seems like you have some 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 sort of roof on your CPU like 60 or 80 percent or whatever, like 50 or 40 percent. That means that there is a usually opportunity to add asynchronous stages to increase the parallelization because it usually means that, that, that you have some contention in sort of making sure that you can't use your, your, uh, your CPUs fully. Um, you can also, you might also need to add a back pressure that, uh, and flow control, and that, that also can be can be can be important to 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 use using to do using a asynchronous strategies. So so usually a combination between them, but you shouldn't be afraid to 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 start with a with like fully synchronous pipelining. I think, <clears throat> but in order to fully scale on demand, I really think we need to, we need two things. As I, as I said, we need to be able to scale up, but we also need to scale out. I mean, I mean scale out means that we need to start using I mean, cluster and cloud computing architectures really, really efficiently, and not just scale up, but also scaling and being elastic by, I mean, true to the word elastic, really. And uh, distributed systems is really the new normal. I mean, we have distributed systems, even, even the, either we want it or not. I mean, I mean, mobile devices are here to stay. Like everything is almost nowadays de deployed on cloud services, or you're using we use REST with no SQL databases. Are usually they're usually replicated and and, and, and run in, in in some sort of farm. Big data, same thing there. So, what is the essence of distributed systems? It's been said to be two things: like to try to overcome the First, the information travels at the speed of light, and second, that independent things fail independently. And what does this mean then? It, it means that the first one means that there's increased latency because it actually takes time. It's actually noticeable that, informa that, that, that it, it takes time for information to travel, uh, which is not really true if, if you're running on in a single core. Um, it still happens, of course, but it's, it's so quick. So you don't notice. I mean, in a distributed system, you do, you 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 will notice, and that independent things fail independently. Is something that <clears throat> that you that will hit you very hard unless you really know or are prepared for it, because it's really a very different world. Uh, you need to deal with things like partial failure, lost messages. That messages can be completely dropped, just flat on the floor, and there's nothing wrong with that. that that's how TCP de deal with congestion, for example. It just drops messages and. And uh, duplicated messages, reordering of messages. If you use UDP or like multiple channels to reach the same destination, 
and 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 it's really one one sort of things that that made that's really apparent is that for, that there is really no difference between a slow node and a dead node. You can't possibly know. You can just take educated guesses. Is the node down, or is it just doing GC, or or, or is something else wrong? You don't know. So you need good failure detectors to to take an educated good guess of what's really happening. So what, what what I'm trying to say is real. It's really a completely different world, right? And 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 uh, one of the like seven fallacies, or is eight fallacies of distributed computing by Peter Doig is that their network is reliable. Well, it's not, right? It's 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 things will just fail in spectacular ways. Uh, and and I, I I have my my favorite like graveyard of distributed systems that I, that I, that I sometimes walk walk people through, is this like based on my experience with, with building dis distributed systems using really bad habits like like did like dis di distributed share mutable state for example, is 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 what I call evil to the power n with n is the number of nodes. I mean, don't get near near that stuff. Serializable distributed transactions, yeah, XA and stuff. Luckily, I've never had to deal with that again. Synchronous RPC, it's really, it's really, it's really. Luckily, we hopefully will never will come back to that again. It's like pretending that you have the same world with the same constraints and same semantics in the, in the local setting as we have on a distributed system, which is completely. Uh, completely wrong. Get guaranteed deliver this really no such thing. And then Martin, Ta Martin Fowler says said it very well when he said that di di distributed objects in general is suck like an inverted hurricane. <clears throat> so I think the key here is that we should we should embrace location transparency. And and the, 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 this, this is like one of the key key things, key sort of principles or like key design. Uh, goals when it comes to actors, and 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 it's one of the underpinnings of 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 of, of ACA. and it's really it's really opposite of transparent distributed computing. It's really to to view local communication as an optimization. That the default is that everything's distributed, and then you get mobility, then you get the system that can actually run, like 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 run every run where where components can run anywhere, and they can actually change topology while the system is running. To optimize for loca locality reference and to minimize coordination, uh, and some people always bring up like Waldo's and Notion of distributed computing, where 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 they argued arguing very well for that that this is a fallacy, and I really believe that 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 paper is, is absolutely true. But but location transparency actually takes the opposite route. It gives you a way of 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 of, of actually managing. Distributed systems by 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 embracing the constraints rather than trying to hide them, because trying to hide them will just lead to leaky abstractions that will just come back and bite you. Always I mean, always in the situation where you want it the least. Uh, so es essentially, I think scaling up and out is the same thing. I mean, either either you have like multiple cores uh, where where where, they, where where you have like a QPA QPI link com communicating between them using message passing. Or you have multiple nodes communicating across the network over multiple data centers communicating over a WAN or something, and and, and if if you rely on 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 two things, share nothing architectures and message passing, embracing the constraints of the network instead of trying to hide them, I really believe that we can write fully elastic systems. So I think that elast elasticity as well requires a message driven architecture in the same in the same sense as resilience does. Uh, so asynchronous message passing, I think, is the enabler. That, that, that is why sort of these, it is this like low-level underpinning of both elasticity resilience and ultra-responsive systems. I can talk more about message passing, but but I think time's running up. I want to have some some time for questions as well. The, the just going to give you just just a brief walk through 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 the types of reactive platform as well that we have. I think I found at Arca to try to 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 address these things. I think what is the right way, and that is that is uh, through fully message passing architecture, delivering resilience through uh, through isolation, through a share nothing, through, through, through a share nothing architecture, so on. But but, but type safe is a, is a lot more than that. We have the play web framework, for example, a fully reactive play web framework is built on Scala, exposing Scala and Java APIs. So you can use whatever you like. We also have Spark now, 
which is a great, I mean, uh, big data or fast data platform um, built on top of Scala and Play. And uh, we just uh, we just about to release what we call this conductor. It's like uh, uh, it's like a a way of managing for operations, managing reactive systems, distributed systems in in a, in a in a very nice and slick and slick way. We also have the types of activator, which is a great it's a great way of getting started building reactive systems. It's it's there we have hundreds of templates there. A lot of them have been most of them have actually been contributed by the community, and then you have things you have things for uh, like templates and 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 uh, and uh, sample code for 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 tons of stuff. Lots of it not re re even related to to TypeSafe. So that, that's a great like resource to get started. And um, I think Reactive is is not just it's not just hype. It's really it's re it's, re it's really happening. This today and it has an immense adoption across so many verticals. I mean, we see we see it being used in media, in social, in technology, uh, uh, like like powering a lot of other interesting technologies, like in education, online services, retail, and finance. Of course, is always like jumping on the first uh, on the on the newest things. And and I see. I think the common sort of theme across all of these is like the need for build, building systems that, that that don't stop, that don't go down, uh, that that can actually help deal with lots of users, lots of data, uh, while staying responsive all throughout. So that was my 50-minute presentation. I hope to had it to finish in 45. So I'm sorry, uh, but I think there should be some time for for questions. Hopefully, you have a. Uh, some understanding what reactive is all about and how to use it in, in the real in the real world yeah that was great thank you so much Jonas um, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning everybody if uh, if you missed any part of the slides or he, that he was showing um, this is all going to be on the code mentor YouTube channel but let's jump to the, uh, some questions feel free to throw more questions into group chat or the Q&A app um, Jonas if you take a look at group chat we've had some questions going in so starting out um, has had a, an interesting one he mentioned how Sony once predicted that at one point all appliances and machines in our house will soon be able to freely distribute jobs across themselves. So you know you might have a TV talking to something else, process rendering, uh, you know the same CPU for a toaster and a fridge. Do you feel like that's still something that could happen? And if that's the case, would it be safe to say that there will be no other kind of programming but async and immutable programming in the near future? That's a, that's a very good question. It's, I, wish, I wish I had a crystal ball that I can just uh, <laughs> tell you yes, yes, I know for a fact. I really, I really think everything points toward, to, towards that. I mean, you, you know, our, mo our mobile devices, even our watches now are getting more and more powerful, and what people just, was just dreaming of, like, like 30 years ago, uh, <clears throat> is like, are actually happening. It's like, and 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 I think that this is just the beginning. So 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 yes, I, I really I, I really believe that all all uh, all computers and, and and what we nowadays call a computer might not even be a computer in the future. Like like might be considered a mainframe. But all I mean all these gadgets that we have will actually be all connected and 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 serving us in a in, in a in a fully real time fashion I, I, I believe. And I'm I'm not very interested in like in like connect hooking up the fridge or the coffee machine. That's more for a joke. <clears throat> but I really believe that, that that in general software is here to to serve to to serve to serve us and, and, and it's and we are I think we are at the at a at a point where that can actually be done re real time and, and, and where there can be like a closed loop. We're actually where 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 systems can actually learn and adapt uh, to our behavior as well. We're not we're not really there yet, but that's why I see you around the corner. And having all these devices and so on, I mean, it's, it's extremely exciting. I think it's also really frightening. I mean, how to deal with things like, sec like security, for example, and 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 and. and and how, to, how and really how do you make it all, all work? I think initially they will all require some sort of like big server backend to deal with all with all this, and that's where I think reactive architectures are really the the the, the savior. I don't think any of the existing middleware like monolithic architectures are really up for the job. We like one thread the per, per per request. I think everything needs to be a fully asynchronous. We need to like fully embrace good protocols all across. 
uh, which I really believe, as you asked, need to be asynchronous all the way through. That's the really only way to deal with all the data that's, that, that, that needs to be transferred back and forth and do that in real time. At least, I mean, soft real time or close to, I mean, in a responsive fashion, I'd say, rather than real time, because that's just a very overloaded term. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to my fridge and my coffee machine talking at some point. Um, uh, Shatan had an interesting question. So, I, I, if you could elaborate a little bit more on never blocking, um, you know, he was he mentioned that for um, you know in a web app context, you know, if I'm using a database, there's a limit on the number of connections which it can handle at any given point of time. So, how do you make something non-blocking? Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. I think at first it's very important that if we take the web request for example, I mean a lot of web requests requires you on the on the back end to call out to I don't know five or ten different servers, and if you and and first if you do the if you do the traditional way, that means that you do one request and then you wait and get a response. You call, you you call the next one and the next one, right? And then you have the response time, like uh, for all the servers uh, and like. Added all added up, right? Right. But 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 if you if you can do it, if you can like decompose them into into small chunks, and that's that's less like that's not dependent in terms of 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 of, of state, and and uh, they're not coupled. Then you can actually run them in parallel, and you can like 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 you get the web request in, you you spin off like like uh, ten calls to REST services or whatever, which which some of them actually might might block. But 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 uh, but you actually you, you don't like. I mean, it's it's actually the response time is is only the slowest one of all all, all of these ten. Like plus the work you need to do, like to compose the work and send it up. And 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 as I said, uh, that that's for like for for like dealing with with things as quickly as you as you as you possibly. We we can can and and doing it in in, in by in by relying on, on 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 like spawning up these these new requests then using for example futures that means that that that, that they will run not in your in your main thread then but they will spin off like like spun off on some other thread pool and run in the background and and you will get notified when the result is back so that means that you can do more useful work. One of them, for example, is like spinning up the next one and the next one, the next one, or some, or perhaps some other useful work. If 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 you have all this spun up or all your all your ten, but but it's also important to 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 take uh, resiliency into account. And if you, if you know that you're actually you, you have a service that do block, uh, I think it's very important to have that run. Like like sort of dispatched on a dedicated thread pool, like like I said in my in my in my in my talk. So so you don't end up in the situation where where one like service going going haywire. I mean, or start just like and and then you start doing a lot of calls, you block up your whole thread pool, and and this means that your whole application actually stalls just because of that service went down for 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 a while. And then you need to add timeouts instead, like in, in being able to like respond to, to the to the to the user with with an with an error with an error message. So 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 I, I think sometimes you have to block, do it then in a sandbox fashion and 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 but when you don't have to block, like spin up tasks using futures or, or, or whatever you like, right? And and, and and compose the result in the end. Uh, when you be notified of the results, instead of just waiting for them, and that's that's okay. the best advice I can get. There, of course, there are other situations as well, and you, you have variations of that. But I, I hope that example made made some sense. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, uh, yeah, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but um, other than the reactive manifesto, what are your recommended resources that people check out to keep learning about all this? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a good that's a good question. I think I think there are there are a lot of like passionate user communities. Uh, we have one around Akka, for example, and one around Play. But if you're if you're into like if you like what, what Netflix are doing, they have a great community around Oryx Java and Hystrix. Like that, have, have, have is another great library for doing fault tolerance. You know, using circuit breakers and stuff. And 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 yeah, yeah. So I think just engage in, in some in some projects that, that really excites you and, and be part of the community and uh, ideally contribute back. But there's so much to learn, and the, most of the communities I've been part of have been extremely helpful and and, and very open 
Uh, there's also almost most conferences nowadays have reactive tracks. I mean, we there are even reactive conferences. Like I've been I've been helping organizing uh, the React Conf a couple of times, which have been a great conference, and. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm also now helping out scheduling a, a like a reactive track at go to Copenhagen. Um, so so it's and I know they have the, the have the same thing at Jax uh, a few weeks ago a reactive track. So I think well that was actually a few months ago. But anyway, I think I think there's a lot to learn in conferences as well. So so but ideally just talk to people and write a lot of code. I'd say that. <laughs> That's the best advice I can get. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Well, well, Jonas, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, I'll send an email out to everyone that RSVP'd with a link to the recording, a couple resources. Obviously, if you are working on anything uh, using Reactive and have any difficulty, Code Mentor is always at your disposal. We have a lot of great experts on there that can help. Um, and uh, please do check out some more uh, office hours coming up. We have a bunch of great ones. Um, we're on Thursday. We're meeting with. Uh, um, uh, David Cohen, of uh, the founder of Techstars, which will be a great session. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, Jonas, thank you so much for your time, and um, and thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, so did we. Awesome. All right, well, take care, everybody.